Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome. Thank you very much for coming to this, uh, this talk. It's going to be a fascinating, uh, I think, hour and 15 minutes or so. My name is Alan Little. I'm a broadcaster and a journalist. And I chair the Edinburgh International Book Festival. So it's a great privilege to me, for me to be seated with this very distinguished panel. We've just been talking in the green room and already the sparks are flying. So let me uh, start by introducing you to uh, the panel. On, the, on my far left is Maya Zabib. She's based in Lebanon. Maya is a theatre performance artist and director and a founding member of Zukak Theatre Company and Cultural Association. Since 2008, she's been working with Zukak in leading and executing a large number of arts and community development projects. Beside her is uh, Willie Doherty. Since the 1980s, uh, he's been an artist and has been a pioneering figure in contemporary art, film, and photography. The primary point of geographical reference for, for Willie uh, during the last three decades has been his native city of Derry in Northern Ireland. Um, Essa Aldegheri is Edinburgh based. She's the chair of the City of Sanctuary Edinburgh, part of a national network committed to building a culture of hospitality and welcome, uh, especially for those seeking sanctuary from persecution and war. So this is one of the burning and defining issues of our time. And beside me, Harriet Lamb is the chief executive of International Alert, London-based but works all over the world, a leading peace-building organization. So we want to look on Monday. Was some, were any of you here on Monday when we looked at... Let's have a show of hands. So some of you were here on Monday, but most of you weren't. We were talking about the role of the arts in conflict. Today we want to talk a bit about the role of the arts in post-conflict. So let me start with um, Maya. Maya, you're, in a, you're from a country that has been plagued by conflict, civil conflict, for much of the last half century. Uh, what, give us some sense of what you do and what you try to achieve with artistic activity and creative activity among people who have emerged from and suffered the consequences of conflict? Um, yes, I mean, uh, in Beirut, in Lebanon, it's, the conflict is uh, always um, present. The, there are different forms of conflict, obviously, but they're continuous somehow. Um, so we're, we're a theater collective that was established 11 years ago. Uh, and we work in a very non-hierarchical structure because we believe this is, there's a way in that kind of work to position ourselves as individuals and as citizens as well. And um, so we do theater that is, um, would be called political, but of course not propaganda political, but rather political in the wide sense of tackling issues that are um, current and uh, important to deal with, especially in a context where there's a lot of censorship and a lot of things are not said, and a lot of the history is not tackled and not dealt with. Uh, so we try to question the status quo in relation to um, religion, to politics, to power in our context, and also to think in a global sense about uh, a lot of issues of migration and things like that, but in a, in a more fictional issue, uh, sense also. But on the other hand, we also work a lot on the ground and we work in different contexts uh, with people from different communities. Uh, marginalized communities, whatever that means, but it's an umbrella that can explain the co difficult context that people live in. So we do a lot of drama therapy, a specific technique that you've developed since 11 years and we've been working in this tool, uh, doing theater with children um, with multiple disabilities, uh, women subjected to domestic violence. We've worked a lot with refugees as well. And so sometimes we create shows with people, sometimes we just do th drama therapy. And sometimes we do what we call th social theater. So it's not a drama therapy process, but rather uh, create a situation where we can uh, create a space for people to tell their stories, to position themselves in relation to their context with uh, fiction of theater. One of the things that happens in a conflict is that people adopt a narrative. This mm -hmm. is the story through which they understand the world and the role of their own side in that conflict. Is it important, do you think, to try to have creative activity in which people are able to step out of their own group narrative? Absolutely, and I think theatre can do that and fiction can do that. This is why we work a lot with fiction. We are very careful in, in dealing with people's stories, so we don't, we don't go to a community and tell them, OK, tell us what happened with you in the war. And I think this is very tricky and it's very dangerous because, especially when you work with youth and you work with children, 
you, you put them in a situation where they open a wound. And if you don't know how to deal with the wound, you are putting them in danger, in a large psychological danger. So we use a lot of fiction. And there, is, there are huge metaphors in fairy tales sometimes, or you know, simple stories that reflect the actual events, but they don't go deep into them in a way that exposes the individual and puts them in a vulnerable position. So for example, you know, working with women who were abused at home and working about with fairy tales. And a lot of the fairy tales have violence in them, but they're in the end fairy tales. So the women would choose the stories they want to work on, and one would choose a fairy tale that I've never had never heard of, which is, I don't know, a, a woman taking a shower and then knives coming down through the water. So it's a metaphor, but it's also about her life, and it's something that she wants to tell at that moment. Mm. And the theater allows her that space. Willie, the, the, this series is called The Spirit of 47. The Edinburgh Festival is one of a series of festivals that were founded in 1947. One was in Amsterdam, one was in Aix-en-Provence, one was, was in Avignon. The Cannes Film Festival reopened in 1946. And they all had the same explicit and, and openly stated purpose, which was to find a way for Europeans to talk to each other again and to find a shared language and to rediscover a shared cultural heritage. Uh, does anything that Maya has said there strike a chord with you in your own experience? Give us some sense of what it is that you're well, trying to achieve. Well, absolutely. I mean, that, that, that makes a lot of sense um, in the context of the north of Ireland and, and what's been happening there through all of my life and continues to happen there. I mean, what I wanted to do really was to, to talk a little bit about that. I mean, mm. um, and, and really say something from the context of uh, an artist who works alone. You know, so I don't work as part of a group of artists or as a, in the kind of theatre context or uh, in collaboration, but really as a kind of um, sole or kind of single artist. So uh, I think that, that that is quite different in, in some ways and, and it's a, maybe a different, a more difficult or a different course to navigate, but um, my engagement with, with that really started in the 1980s. Um, I mean, I prepared something that that I thought I might read, um, so that I don't kind of ramble off uh, and get kind of waylaid. Um, so, I mean, really, the early photographic work that I made in the 1980s was, in some ways, a response to how the town of Derry, and also to some extent the north of Ireland um, in general, were pictured by visiting photojournalists. And we talked a little bit about this earlier. Um, so there were familiar tropes here of. Um, Kids throwing stones, British soldiers crouched on the streets, uh, and children playing nearby, and their mothers scurrying to get out of the road with, with prams. Uh, my avoidance of the drama implied by such images in favour of views of the city that were devoid of the human figure and where nothing appeared to be happening was an attempt on my part to evolve a new language or indeed a new space that might allow for a different perspective on some of the underlying complexities of that situation. Um, so in that sense, I often think of my work from that time as a parallel activity to that of the media, in the sense that I was looking at the same events as they unfolded and were subsequently reported, and then used words and images to describe something of the larger experience from the perspective of a citizen and an artist. Um, so for me, that was very important that I was really making this work as someone who lived in that place, and not from the perspective of, of an outsider or a visitor. Um, and really how, how the, the story of the Troubles was told in the mainstream media and consequently understood by their audiences became, for me, something that was central to my work, but I recognised at one point became something more difficult following the imposition of uh, what you might remember was called the Broadcast Media Ban in 1988. Um, I remember it very well. Yeah, th this measure and a similar ban in the Republic of Ireland prohibited the voice of Sinn Féin and ten other prescribed organisations um, from radio and television broadcasts. Um, after some initial confusion about the limits of the ban, one of the ways in which broadcasters worked around this was to use the voices of actors to replace the voices of those who were covered by the ban. Um, so during this period, I explored this absence or denial of the, of the voice through a number of works, um, which really led to my use of voiceover in the video works that I would go on to produce. Mm -hmm. um, the first of which was a, a work called The Only Good One's a Dead One, um, where two roles, those of the murderer and of the victim, 
uh, which would conventionally be portrayed by two separate actors, uh, or voiced by the same actor in this work. Um, as he drives along a dark country road at night, the narrator imagines how he will be shot, and alternatively, how he will plan and carry out the murder of someone else. Uh, so the work creates an imaginative space for the unspeakable, uh, where revenge is the flip side of fear, and where the murderer and the victim share the same impulse. Mm -hmm. So for me, th this is really an important um, aspect of this, that, that the artist should be able to create some kind of space where yeah. what is not able to be spoken within the conventional yeah. Media, if you want. Yeah, I, I, I want to interrupt you there, Willie. I can see you've got more. <coughs> I want to get round the, sure. the, the panel. Uh, but it, we talked a bit on Monday about how the arts can ex can can excavate truths, a form of truth that isn't available to journalism of any sort, mainstream media or otherwise. So you can you can explore and, and develop a, 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 not just an, an altern not an alternative rea reality exa exactly, but you can you can expose and explore a different kind of experience that. Mainstream journalism, however earnest, however valid, however serious, cannot simply cannot reach. Esther, let me bring you in. You you work here in Scotland with uh, recently arrived refugees. They're looking for sanctuary. They're looking for refuge. They're looking for food. They're looking for employment, possibly. Mm -hmm. They're worried about their futures. What role does artistic and creative experience? What appeal does it have for them? It's a need rather than appeal. From what I've seen and what I've heard and I think Harriet will agree as well. What I am doing at the moment is um, researching and funded by the Economic and Social Research Council to investigate what methods of story exchange best facilitate the encounter between forced migrants, people who are forced to come to mm -hmm. Europe and local populations as well as the City of Sanctuary work. And so I'm observing a series of projects that use different ways of story exchange, including theatre and photography and other forms of drama, um, expressing stories in such ways as what you call the common language, the shared language, is best found between people who are forced to come here and be between people who live here. And I'm very keen to talk with and about the people who live here who are deeply resentful of the people who are forced to come here. And when these encounters occur and dialogue manages to happen, I am observing that it's very, very often through art and arts-based practices that are able to, to do the things that you have been talking about now. So on one hand, take people out of their individual stories and allow them to inhabit the story of the other so that the other is no longer the other, but is maybe your cousin or your great-grandmother. And going back to the spirit of 47, Europe was at war not that long ago, but we have forgotten we often act as if we have forgotten. And in a sense, the art made by people fleeing from conflict, so post-conflict art in Europe, about situations that are not European, that are other, I have seen them serve to remind Europeans about how actually there is a lot in common. Not that all conflicts are the same conflict, but that we can learn from listening to these stories. Mm. So it's a need to express. If there's a person from Syria in Scotland, there is a need, of course, for food and shelter and medical appointments and good schools for the children, but there's also a need to express the story because the story is yourself. Mm. And, and no person has a single story. But if you're not allowed to say who you are and where you're from, mm. then you're not really fully living. And it's mm. not necessarily sanctuary, it's just mm. surviving. Mm. That's what I have observed. Those of you who were here on Monday will remember uh, that I mentioned uh, a production of, and we were talking about this in the green room earlier, a production of Waiting for Godot that I went mm. to during the siege of Sarajevo in a basement theater. You could hear the sounds of the war outside professional actors performing it, uh, uh, directed by Susan Sontag. And it was packed. Uh, it ran for three weeks or something. And people risked their lives to come and see it. And when you spoke to the audience afterwards, and you said, you, know, you need shelter, you need protection from the war, you need food, you need clean water. Why do you want to come to the theater in such circumstances like this? And they said, because mm. Susan Sontag has brought us something that the United Nations, for all its efforts, can't bring, which is a sense of validation of, of us as citizens and citizens of a city and, and citizens who need creative activity, creative um, processes, as well as stale pasta mm. and feta cheese from um, well-meaning European governments. Um, and they named the square, Susan Sontag Square, after she died, uh, the square outside the National Theatre. So that is... Yeah. 
that was a lesson for me that people need this yeah. as human beings. You know, they said we're not beasts of the field. Yeah. Um, Harriet, let me ask you, you, you run a, a big peace building organization. So you're in a sense a sponsor of, of this kind of artistic community. Do you harness, do you, when you choose what sort of artistic, uh, artistic activity to promote and fund and support, do you have a specific end in mind? Can you harness a, a artistic activity to a, an ach a definable and achievable goal? Well, in some ways you can, and I guess that's the tension that we're grappling with. I mean, I think that the founding of the festival, a very brilliant piece of work by the British Council and others 70 years ago, was exactly about thinking, how can you use the art to encourage uh, the reconciliation of people and the celebration of humanity? Uh, so there's one, one goal, if you like. But you can also go beyond that. You can actually also see the very process of creating art as a way of building peace for people. And when, when the guns fall silent, artists can step into the ruins of people's lives and help them give expression to those raw emotions and those feelings about identity. Um, and to help people rebuild their lives, which is just as important as the, the health uh, and the water and the housing. And indeed, that's what artists say to us time and time again. We've been working with the British Council with Syrian artists um, living in Lebanon, but actually right across Europe. And they talk about their desperate need to, to give voice to their artistic selves uh, and to come together as a network of artists to celebrate uh, all that is good about Syria and to talk about the amazing outpouring of uh, civil society and people's uh, artistic expression in the very midst of the war. And I think that the need for this kind of discussion about how arts and peace building can best come together. I mean, this couldn't be a more timely discussion. At the minute, now 70 years since the end of the Second World War, we face the biggest humanitarian crisis since then. We have the largest movement of people, the biggest uh, number of battle deaths for 25 years. And only this morning, I expect we all put on our radios and heard Trump and North Korea uh, ratcheting up the tension all the time. So I think the need to think, how can we build peace, all of us as citizens, is what the arts can help do. Because just as uh, it takes the armed men, usually, let's face it, the armed men to sit around and do a peace deal, the peace deal will only hold if the citizens can come together and live together again. So, so we always see peace building a bit like a pyramid. Right at the top, you've got the people signing. But actually, half of all peace deals fall apart within five years because the people who've been brutalized by, in some, you know, in the case of Syria, it's now seven years of war. How are they going to live together again unless we invest just as much in people and their humanity as we do invest in rebuilding the infrastructure, the roads, the housing, or indeed taking out mines? You know, we go inch by inch to take out mines to make an area safe from the debris of war. And in the same way, we have to work with children who've been brutalized by war to talk about what they've been through so just to finish with one example from the, from the project we worked on with the British Council and Eti Jihad, a Lebanese uh, organization. It's a little 12-year-old boy living in the Bekaa Valley in the refugee camps, a Syrian refugee. And when he first came to the theatre and music workshops, he was absolutely silent, introverted, and actually when he wanted something, he was violent, because that's what he'd known most of his life by being given a chance through theater, through music, to express emotions in a non-verbal way, he actually, by the end, became much more communicative, much more expressive, much more at peace with himself. And I guess those are the approaches. We want to see how can we scale them up, although it's wrought with complexities and difficulties, which we perhaps discuss as well. Maya, both you and Willie have lived through conflicts that have had, to some extent, negotiated ends. It's sometimes my impression at the end of a conflict even if it's not a definitive end and even if the peace is fragile, can be as traumatic in some ways as the conflict itself. Because once the conflict, once the guns fall silent, you have to face the endless, f the years of future uh, uh, that lie ahead in the future. And th then the pressing need to make sense of what has happened. Mm -hmm. uh, is that, does that chime with your experience? I mean, in Lebanon, there is a kind of, um, uh, there was amnesty, so, Nothing happened. <laughs> Let's move on. And obviously, this is quite problematic. Um, because there's no justice. There's no justice. The same leaders who have been leading the civil war are still in the government. The president now was 
a major part of the civil war. He was leading the army and fighting and killing people. So, and not just him, a lot of people who are in government have been in the war and they all feel very innocent and it's very problematic. And uh, even in the history books at schools, uh, the, the, the history stops at the end of the French mandate. So nothing happened afterwards. Nobody talks about it because nobody agrees and nobody is saying who did what. So there's no shared narrative. And the biggest issue is that there are over 70,000 uh, um, um, missing people who obviously ha most probably have been killed and been buried in mass graves. And everybody knows where the mass graves are, but nobody is willing to open them up. And this is one of the biggest tragedies in Lebanon. People still wait for their husbands and sons and daughters sometimes. And yeah, you have like women standing in the streets with images of their missing husbands and sons, and they don't have a closure about this issue because nobody wants to open one grave and that the other, and which one do you open first, and how do you count, and how many, who killed how many, and nobody wants to go into that. There is a, an imperative to forget. Yes. Which is hard to accept, isn't yeah, it? Absolutely. It was the, in South, when I lived in South Africa, it was the time of the um, Truth and Reconciliation Commission, mm -hmm. and it was called Truth and Reconciliation, it wasn't called Truth and Justice. And Desmond Tutu mm -hmm. was the chair, and in some ways it was a very Christian, uh, undertaking because he was saying you the, suffer the people who have suffered have to accept that your sacrifice must be born in order to redeem future generations and they were being asked to forget not to forgive but simply to forget and forego their right to justice mm. how do you as an artist how do you interrogate that that imperative um, we put things on the table we, we like for example talking about peace one of the projects that we've done uh, it was about the, 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 an organization approached us who, to create a work and tour it across Lebanon and that it had to be under the umbrella of uh, performing for peace. For, so after we laughed for a bit, we said, <laughs> like, what do you mean, peace? We cannot talk about peace in, in, you know, in refugee camps, in Palestinian refugee camps, because the Palestinian people can't go to their homes. So can, I can go and talk about, put up a play about peace where these children are brought up and thinking about the key they have to take from their grandma in order to try and go find their house and they know that's not going to happen. So peace is a very long way ahead. So we started with history. So we tried to work out what happened. And we created a show and it reminded me of what you just said. The, the, we created a show where we, put the, we dissected the corpse of history. So it's a, one, it's a person and that person is at the same time the victim and the perpetrator so he tells the story from both sides and it's exactly what you were had just said and we toured this performance more than 50 times it's the show that we've done the most because we've toured it across Lebanon in villages and mm. we've done it you know mostly in marriage send marriage um, halls or funeral halls that's where people gather so and at the end we'd open the stage for people to talk about forgetting and not forgetting because the corpse at the end decides that he wants to forget mm. and then we open the stage for people and they start telling their own stories and thus narrating the oral history of what happened and in each part of the country different stories would come up and people would be happy in one sense in one part of the show and angry at the other depending on what what part of the country they are. And in mm. some cases, we had amazing testimonies. There was a militia man who said, I have killed people. And he started talking about his experience. And these are things you don't talk about in the village. Mm. People know that he's a militia man, and he, they know who he had killed, but they, he would never dare say it in another context. So mm. that's what theater can do, in a way. There are also parallel truths in Northern Ireland. Is it possible parallel lines don't converge yeah. by definition? Mm -hmm. Is it possible to make these parallel truths converge? Well, I mean, first of all, I, I just want to say I'm, I'm kind of quite careful about uh, talking about Northern Ireland on the same kind of level as, as these other situations. You know, in, in comparison, it seems like a minor scuffle, you know? <laughs> um, but having said that, I mean, uh, I mean, the Northern Ireland Assembly, as you know, at the moment is in a period of crisis. I mean, it, it hasn't uh, been functioning since the start of the year. 
Um, and there are many things that separate the two main political parties there. Uh, but I think the main or the fundamental thing is that they really don't know how they can tackle the issues of the legacy of the mm. conflict of the past. Mm. And that's all of the other things I think can be kind of put together in some way so that this peace process can be kept on the road. But there's, but there's, but, a, there's a parallel there with, with, with Maya's experience in the sense that people who suffered and lost are being asked to let it go yeah, yeah, in no, the I, interests of peace. I think that, Forget it. Absolutely. I mean, that, that, that was one of the ways in which the peace process was sold to everyone in the north of Ireland, that um, the peace dividend of the peace process would be, would require everyone to forget about the past in some way. So to indulge in a kind of collective amnesia, that this stuff needed to be set aside. But I think there's, there's only um, so much set aside that, that is sustainable. And I think part of the difficulty with this is that we, that gets uh, kicked along the road, but we're rapidly run out of road yeah. in the north of Ireland. Uh, and part of the difficulty about this is that um, the available words and images that are used to define and describe the issues uh, are themselves exhausted, um, oversaturated with layers of historical baggage and weighed down by the burden of experience. Um, so you, you could really, in some ways, argue and suggest that, that this is the ideal place uh, and the ideal opportunity to engage with a, a wide range of artistic practitioners to, to come into that process uh, and bring fresh ideas and inject some imagination into how mm. you know, the politicians and society in, uh, at large could, could get beyond some of those problems. However, unfortunately, as things stand, I think there's very little prospect of artists being invited to contribute to any future process that might attempt to get to terms with these matters, really because in this society where politi when the, politi the political class undervalues the arts and the artists to such an extent that it's almost impossible to envisage a point at which there might be some serious engagement with the potential that the arts could bring. So I mean, that, that's the kind of other side of, of the, this aspiration, I suppose, that, that the arts can contribute. In, in a situation that, like Northern Ireland, where the needs are are different. They're, they're not the kind of immediate needs of the arts having to really provide a kind of succor to people in a way that they have been denied. I mean, mm. that isn't the case because mm. people can go to the theatre, people can go to the cinema, people can go to the exhibitions, they can have a normal, if you want, fulfilled life through the arts. Mm. But what else can the arts do or what else can the artists do in terms of somehow mediating or negotiating in this space where the language that the politicians have available to them and the language that permeates the media and, and really the language that we all use to describe the problem is mm -hmm. so useless in a way. Yeah. And um, also, yeah, yes, sir. when you're trying to fundraise for projects, as a sort of fun project manager hat, if you're trying to fundraise for a project, as you say, the language that is available to you to talk about the benefits of this project is so dry and skimpy that you have to end up with stupid titles like touring for peace because that's what will get you money yeah. to get the visas and then you have to do what you want afterwards but then yeah. you have to report back to funders and as you say the imagination of the potential that can yeah, be delivered yeah. is is very limited but looking at various studies that have been done on projects that build peace and dialogue in Europe and beyond the most uncomfortable ones are the ones who keep on asking the questions. So with the language that is available to us, if you keep on digging mm. into the unresolved and the unspoken and the forgotten, the answers that come back are deeply uncomfortable for every single person, including the participants, including the funders, including the politicians. And where do you go from there? Mm -hmm. <sighs> this, I'll, just one little observation before I bring you in, Harriet. There, there was a, there's a, very, a story that I find very moving from the 1940s, from the Second World War, during the Blitz in London. The, con the entire contents of the National Gallery were evacuated, all the paintings and, and um, sculptures from the National Gallery were taken and hidden in some cave in Wales uh, for the duration of the war. But the curators of the National Gallery brought at any one time one painting, a single work of art, and displayed it in the National Gallery. And on the, f on the day of its arrival, people queued right round Trafalgar Square to go and see a single painting. Mm -hmm. And that is about 
what you were talking about, Esther, about the people who have the, a need mm. for creative expression. It wasn't harnessed to any political ambition. It wasn't meant to achieve anything, mm. but it was valuable for its own sake, in and of itself. Um, mm. Harriet, there is a problem, isn't there, with uh, f funding and deciding which boxes you want uh, artistic activity to tick, isn't there? Uh, definitely, and I must just say, tragically, Alan, we're not a big fund giver. We're a very small organisation <laughs> yeah. that goes around begging for funds, facing <laughs> all these constraints. And uh, I absolutely don't think if peace is going to hold, you can expect people to have collective amnesia that actually the most effective uh, peace processes have been a form of telling the truth to seek reconciliation, mm -hmm. sometimes to seek forgiveness as well. And, I mean, it is extraordinary. We have a, a video of a woman in Rwanda, for example, sitting next to a man who's killed 10 members of her family. And she puts out her hand and puts it on his knee and says, I forgive him. And in a way, she doesn't have any choice almost because he lives next door to her in the same village. How are they going to rebuild that nation, that village, their lives, unless they can find a way to articulate what they've been through and find a way to live together, which is where I really believe that the arts can play such a critical role. Not just the arts, you absolutely also have to tackle the root causes. If you don't deal with the root underlying causes mm. and the injustices, you're only ever putting the pressure cooker lid on, and in mm. the end it will explode, which is obviously the worry in someone like mm. Levin. Which, uh, so just to sort of point to a problem, I really, um, this, this fact that not enough is invested in the arts, that side of the tackling the issue, and that it's often very short term. So we started working, if, if you look at Lebanon, for example, already had its own conflict, now hosting 25% um, of the population are refugees. Mm. That would be like the United Kingdom taking 14 million people as refugees. We, by the way, have promised to take 20,000 Syrian refugees by 2020. So to put it in context, very tiny mm. country, enormous pressure. So there was short-term funding to do this work on Create Syria and uh, working in, in an area where uh, there are many Syrian refugees and that the, the, they were running the programme. And when some of the Lebanese community realised that this arts programme was being run by Syrians, they left. Because they're angry, the tension is really high. They can't get into their doctor or whatever. So you have to give it the careful time and attention it mm. takes. That takes dialogue and you, of course you can build it up but you can't do it in five minutes to let's put on a play or something. Mm -hmm. You can do it over time where gradually, gradually, using skills, you can bring people together. And so we can't assume that peace building and arts is one happy, clappy, loving. It needs mm. time, investment, and it needs skills from mm. all sides. That will chime with your experience, Esther, because you're working with forced migrants and refugees in an atmosphere in which much of the ambient mood music is anti-immigrant anti altogether, never mind anti-refugees and asylum seekers. Yeah, yeah. And, I mean, going back to, to what you just said about Syria, talking to the Syrians who, who I've spoken to who are in Edinburgh, I ask them, you know, where are you from? And it's an open question. And they say often from, from Lebanon because they don't want to talk about home because they want to forget. That's a parenthesis. Mm. But they then say Lebanon was awful. They treated us worse than dogs. It was a terrible experience. And... And everyone here has great sympathy and thinks that Lebanese people are horrible that I've spoken to. But actually, Lebanon was effectively under Syrian military occupation for decades. You couldn't speak in the streets. Mm -hmm. It was awful. And, and, and people don't speak about that. So the layers that need excavated. And here, in the context of the widespread discourse that immigrants and forced migrants are here to steal healthcare and jobs and school places and all these things, it's rooted, I see, in a, in a narrative of scarcity and in a narrative of fear that is a, a response to needing to preserve the status quo that we have become used to, which was not the case in 1947. And the NHS was set up shortly after that. Um, but the, the, the idea that resources are scarce, it depends on what you're used to. It depends on what you want to maintain. Mm. And, and the idea that arts can break into that narrative in that sense that is this the what do we want to keep what kind of society are we thinking of here where everyone has two foreign holidays abroad and three houses and loads of cars or actually do we want to have a society where people are allowed to seek refuge and are given a chance to become 
and enrichment. And, can I and, and arts yeah. really, you know, I think that is one of the key mm. questions in, in Britain, in Europe and beyond, yeah. because migration is movement, is change, and it's going to keep on happening. It's going to get a lot, a lot more prominent. And can I ask you, is, is there, in what you've observed about the interaction with people who already live here, mm. is there an equivalent in your head to the, to the woman saying, in Rwanda saying, I forgive you, or, or have, you, have you noticed a, a, a discernible shift in, in people's attitudes as they, take, as they involve themselves in this kind of creative enterprise? Does I have, it work? I, I have noticed, what, what I've seen works is whatever manages to allow the imagination of the local, say, say that the, the person, the, so I, I work between Scotland and Italy, and I'm Italian and Scottish myself, so the, the resentful northern Italian person who can't find a job and whose kids don't have a prospect of jobs after university, if that person is involved in something, often arts-based, that allows their imagination to link this foreign brown or black, usually differently dressed person, to their own history, to their own family, to their own life, and some kind of dialogue occurs. When that happens, then there is a chance that the encounter becomes one of building together. Mm. And it doesn't, conflict, conflict can then allow to build together. If you have a good argument with someone, mm. then, then sometimes you're friends afterwards. Mm. <laughs> but it has to, there has to be a spark of dialogue. And I've seen that happen through work placements. I've seen that happen through theater, photography taken together, lots of different media. And that's what I'm studying and that's what I'm working mm. on. But people also shy away from, from letting conflict re replay itself mm -hmm. and sometimes that also needs to happen. Mm -hmm. On the way here there was a woman crying in the street on Nicholson Street in floods of tears. She'd just come out of court, she's been banned from her own house, her son she might not see again, she was going to be homeless, she was clearly really off her, she wasn't sober and she was saying you know I'm Scottish, I'm Scottish and I can't find a house in Scotland, look at all these people, why am I Scottish and I can't find, why do they let people who are not Scottish in? just on my way here mm. and 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 it's not right that she should say that necessarily but that's a really strong emotion and it's her life and, and it's you notice what it she on, sees with many of homeless people in edinburgh now this is something new so that they paint the saltire on yeah. their boards to say yeah. i'm specially deserving because yeah. i'm from here yeah the, I, i'm from here the resources of here are for me yeah and and what do you say and it's a symptom of where us. do you start yeah harriet I just wanted to pick up on that point about can art, um, because it allows people to come out of their normal selves, can it help bring people together? And um, actually, if you go just on the plane three and a half hours from Edinburgh, you in Ukraine, which is a country at war, and uh, on the border, the line of confrontation, we were working in a town uh, painting some peace murals at the time of UN International Day of Peace, September the 21st. And uh, some of the local community said, this is ridiculous, we're at war, what are you doing drawing? Uh, but after a bit, they got into it and they started painting the mural. And the whole point was, in the process, it was together with the host community, the mm. people who lived in the town, and there's millions of internally displaced people mm. who fled from the east, which is now um, occupied, they would say, have uh, fled over the, uh, have got internally displaced within Ukraine. And so there, it's really interesting that there's nothing different about them except they come from a slightly different, you know, it can be as little as, you know, 10 kilometers away <laughs> on the other side of the line. So of course, once they started painting together, before they knew it, mm. they were absolutely saying this was amazing because this was about celebrating our shared humanity mm. and knowing what's, if we're gonna get over this war, we've got to find that beauty our in our lives again. shared humanity or our shared Ukrainianness. They know our shared humanity mm -hmm. because the Ukrainianness is the point that's at, that, that's at conflict. Mm -hmm. What is Ukraine? Where are the lines drawn? Is all part of the conflict. So mm -hmm. it wasn't about where Ukrainian together, it's where people together. And I think that's what art can do because art takes you out of those political narratives. Let me ask the question then of whether art can be a force for, for bad, for whether art can be harnessed to malign and destructive and divisive ambitions. The, 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 the mention of murals puts me in mind of Northern Ireland, really. Yeah, I mean, I mean one of the things that, that happened with the murals after the peace process started was uh, the Arts Council of Northern Ireland um, uh, had an initi initiative of reimagining the murals. So, you know, murals that, you know, appeared in traditional kind of Republican or Loyalist areas were, with the kind of consent of that community, reimagined. Uh, and do something less interesting than had been there before. Um, 
But, uh, and it was, a, it was one of those kind of initiatives that didn't meet with that kind of response where people were out kind of changing these um, King Billies or kind of tricolors or whatever uh, and sharing their humanity, but, but more uh, kind of hedging their bets until they could replace them with something even more aggressive, you know? So, I mean, unfortunately, in the north of Ireland, I mean, th those kinds of attempts to, um, you know, have those kinds of initiatives um, to uh, reimagine those kinds of uh, iconic images that, that in themselves haven't been really kind of fully taken apart and negotiated and kind of, on, uh, you know, really figured out in some way. Um, those attempts haven't really met with such success. So, again, I mean, I, I think it, it's hard to kind of they talk about all these things in the same kind of playing field, if you want. I mean, I think the north of Ireland is a, is a particularly um, interesting case. I mean, it's a, it's a place that's interesting as a kind of case study of how things could evolve after a period of what looks like relative stability and peace. Um, but the, the failure to deal with the, the really kind of fundamental underlying issues really, you know, does tend to come back and bite, you know. Um, so, I mean, what I'm interested in is how, you, how you, uh, individual artists, you know, may or could find a place within that. I mean, at the moment, I mean, this goes back to your um, remarks about funding opportunities or solutions. At the moment, the way the Arts Council of Northern Ireland is set up, I mean, and I think it's an organisation that probably the, has the least funding of all of the Arts Councils in, in these islands, yeah. you know. So that, let's say something of the way in which the arts are regarded there anyway. You know, the, the, there is no real kind of proactive program or mechanism mm. um, that really attempts to kind of deal with this. I mean, like, I'm an artist who's worked there, um, as I said earlier, on my own for a number of decades. I mean, in some ways the work that I make touches on this, but it's never been funded directly through any kind of organized program. Mm -hmm. um, it, it just happens by kind of coincidence that, that I happen to live in this place. Um, and I, but it would, be, it would be really interesting to see how uh, an organization like the Arts Council could begin to kind of engage with artists, could look at how their funding structures need to be, mm -hmm. could reinvent it or, or reorganize. And, well, and also how that, how that interacts with government because I mean, in a way, in somewhere like the north of Ireland, the only way that, that, that the art that could be produced out of that could be of any use, if it actually has some direct impact on how government thinks and how government makes decisions and how government negotiates th these differences and, and these issues that on their own are unable to resolve. Um, but as I said earlier, I don't think that, well, I'm less than optimistic that that's something that's going to happen soon, but I think it's an interesting uh, challenge for artists and also for arts organizations and for government itself to kind of, you know, really want to engage with artists and give artists the space uh, and the funding to um, ask the difficult questions and, you know, really begin to kind of uh, in a different kind of way, to say, well, what could we replace these murals with? You know, not you know, not a kind of you know, something. A mural amnesia. Yeah, something kind Somewhere. of so benign that it it doesn't actually serve anyone. You know. <laughs> yeah. So let me ask um, Maya the question: Have you come across examples in your own uh, country, in your own region, of of art harnessed to a malign, as opposed to benign purpose? I mean. Um, I think, I mean, it's so hard to do art and generally in our region that nobody would go through the trouble to do it for the bad reasons. <laughs> Everybody has good intentions, mm -hmm. but I guess sometimes good intentions are not enough. Mm -hmm. And I think it comes from, like, there are two things that affect the art in that sense. First is funding. At the moment, there's a lot of funding for work that's coming from our region, especially from Syria, work that is dealing with war, stories of suffering. So there is a kind, there is, um, there's danger in that because it's affecting sometimes the narratives, it's affecting the quality of the work, and a lot of people are writing stories about that because there's money for it. And it's very tricky. 
I think, and it's very questionable. And we've been put in situations where we were asked to do certain projects in certain communities because it, um, you know, it's part of the agenda of the organization's mm. political work. So everything is political. All money is political, obviously, but you have to navigate the politics of it and know, know what compromise you're doing mm. as an artist and how big is it. And so how do you... And I, I'm not blaming, I'm just saying that it's, it's a difficult c situation when there's no actual local funding for the arts, there is international funding, and each fund comes with a, an agenda. So as an artist, you have to understand the implications of these agendas and what it means and how you are representing yourself, especially when you're performing abroad. How do you position yourself as an Arab artist, especially when you're put most of the time in festivals with Arabness, about Arab artists, about the war, about... And I've been, I've been told by, like, that was a long time ago, but one curator asked me, do you have something about war? <laughs> he actually did that. And he's a wonderful guy. I mean, he's, he had good intentions, but, I mean, that question for me makes me crazy. Like, what does it mean? I don't know. I'm, I'm yeah. not sure. Yeah. And there's that, but there's also the work that good intended artists want to do with underprivileged communities. And that's a whole lot of other issues. We were talking about this before and how dangerous that is and how arrogant sometimes it is. You, have, you know, as an artist, we do a lot of work like that, but we always question our, our, our intentions and question what we want from this and how we position ourselves. So as an artist working with people who agreed to work with you, you have to know that you're not helping them. It's not about helping or assisting. It's about opening a space for a conversation that would not otherwise happen. Opening a possibility for an expression that would not have otherwise happened. And as Harriet said, you can't build a lasting peace on a silence or a sense of, or, or a culture yeah. of denial and, a, and, a, and a, an imperative to forget. And so it is through because the political imperative is to forget and not raise it for yeah. fear of opening old wounds, it is through artistic expression often mm. that people find that the world acknowledges their story. Mm. Yeah. But I think to your point, there are so many examples of dictators and repressive regimes using art for malign mm. purposes. Um, just as uh, and we're talking about 70 years ago, yeah. I mean, undoubtedly the Nazis used art for malign purposes, and that would just be one of a myriad examples. And the war artists of the First World War on the Allied side yeah. as well. Exactly. Sent on, to paint propagandistic yeah. Yeah. art. Yes, exactly. On, uh, so it's always on both sides, you, using yeah. art. And that's one of the tensions that comes up as well, isn't it? Are we uh, instrumentalizing? art somehow? Are we using art for peace building? Is that any better than people who use art for warmongering? Mm -hmm. It's sometimes a challenge and artists in particular say, no, 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 I'm an artist first and foremost. Mm -hmm. I want to create art. Uh, but it's also being purposeful about the way you do that to build pieces. I think what Willie was touching on, mm -hmm. that if you're not purposeful about it, if you just say, mm, let's paint mm -hmm. over this mural, I mean, obviously <laughs> negotiate it, but nonetheless, unless it's really sustained and purposeful, it yeah. won't last. Mm -hmm. And there you are just waiting to come back in and yeah. put back on you know, the men of violence. The divisive ones, yeah. Exactly, because you haven't given it that long-term yeah. sustained attention and the yeah. building with the community. I used this example on Monday, so forgive me, but those of you who are here who will recognize it, but in 2014 I went back to Sarajevo for the 100th anniversary of the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand, and the Bosnian government had invited the Vienna Philharmonic to come and perform in the building that uh, Archduke Franz Ferdinand had walked out of to meet his death. <laughs> <laughs> so coming from Vietnam, it was a great act, gesture of reconciliation. It was there because the Bosnian government wanted to say, we consider ourselves part of the traditions of Central Europe now. Mm -hmm. And the Serbs, of course, boycotted it. And at the very moment when the Vienna Philharmonic were performing, they, just about four or five miles away, unveiled a statue of the assassin, Gavril Princip, <laughs> to make a point. Now, that was an artistic en enterprise, mm -hmm. but it was designed to perpetuate division. Yeah. Rather than, seek a, rather than seek a shared narrative. Let's get some, some observations or questions from the audience. Um, does anybody have a question to any or all of the, the panel or an observation to make? Please, yes. David, yeah. There's a, there's a roving microphone. Thank you. It, it's following on from Willie's point, really. I was kind of wondering if maybe some of the other panel might uh, consider this, that Willie seems to be describing the role of the artist not necessarily kind of solving the problem or bringing communities together, but more flagging up the questions that weren't being asked, or, yeah. and particularly posing those or finding 
who is questioning whether it's possible to pose those to government, rather than kind of, in a way, solve the problems of society for the government. I'm wondering, are any of the other panelists aware of any examples of where that might have been achieved, or aware of any experience of that being attempted? Yes, sir. So art, your question is, examples of when art has been used to pose difficult questions to government? Yes. Can you use the microphone, David? Sorry, some of the examples about, um, that we've been talking about are very much about kind of working with the community to try and solve the problems of division. But what, what I understood Willie's talking about, the role of the independent artist, is there potentially to not necessarily kind of act as the, the solution for government, but to more to flag up on behalf of society, perhaps to government, the failings of policy or the failings of understanding within those that are generating policy. Hmm. I was wondering if, if that was something which chimed at all with other people's understanding of the role of artists. It's, it's, asking, well, it's asking art to carry a heavy burden to seek solutions, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but, but I'm, I'm desperately trying to think of an example, which no doubt I will think of the minute we leave this building. But <laughs> definitely where I really... Uh, uh, governments will only act what they think will, is the, you know, will make them popular for their constituents or whatever. So part of what we always want to do, isn't it, is push issues back up their agenda in order to push government to act. So I think that's why we can't pick up their load alone ourselves as civil society, as artists, because it will never be enough. Therefore, you always want, as I think as civil society, you're always trying to say, how do we push government to do the things that they want to do? And I think in that, you have to be creating the dialogue, the discussion, the narrative, the debate that hopefully will feed through that then pushes politicians to, to take the actions that you, you believe need taking at the level and the scale that they can do it. So I think that's if you really believe in the role of, of all of us as citizens, it's that we can all play our part because we can all put pressure on our governments to do things. And the art is a very powerful way of doing that because it steps outside the narrow dialogue of the politicians and it does give expression to things in another way. And sometimes you need that shift, particularly in conflict situations, to open the space for politicians and governments to do really difficult things. You, you mentioned Desmond Tutu, and he's actually one of the patrons of International Alert. And, and one of his great sayings is, if you want to make peace, you don't talk to your friends, you talk to your enemies. Mm. But that's really hard for them to do. Mm. And artists can be among the vanguard of helping create that space to show it is possible. Mm. And if it's possible to do these things, come on, government, you can come too. Maya, how would you characterise in your own experience the, this, this uh, interface, if you like, between creative activity, artistic activity and public policy? I mean, when you live in a real democracy, there is hope in that. But when you live in a pseudo-democracy, no. We try as much as we can to stay away from the government and as much as we can to not be known by the government and that our work is not uh, necessarily obviously threatening because we want to continue being able to do the work. And um, yeah, a lot of it's becoming, even though Lebanon is a democracy and uh, the situation is much better than our other Arab countries, especially for the arts, more and more a lot of um, censorship is happening. People are being locked up for things they are, said, they are saying. This wasn't happening before. So we are very careful about addressing the government directly because we don't believe in it and we don't believe that the people in the government are actually working for the people of the country. They're more working for their own benefit and for their own money. And, and does, that then create, does that recreate a kind of culture in which it used to be said in communist Eastern Europe, the censor isn't at my desk, he's in my head. Does it create a habit of self-censorship? Are there certain kinds of creative expression that you might mm -hmm. avoid in order to stay out of prison? Yes, I mean, um, it's, uh, they won't put us in prison necessarily unless we really talk about someone and like a certain political leader and ag address him directly. Uh, so, but there are things, you, you know, that are censored, which obviously are religion, uh, sex, and politics. And all our work is about religion, sex, and politics. <laughs> but we find a way to, to talk about it, not just because we don't want to be put away or censored, because also we want to reach out to people who are not like us, or not to just preach for the choir, and to, to, to talk to people who want to hear, to, who can hear us till the end. 
rather than go with a big statement that aggresses people's beliefs or uh, social uh, norms. So we go about talking about a lot of very daring issues. We talk about sexuality in a, in a show recently with, with youth who were watching. There was a priest, there was, there was two nuns, and there was a religious Muslim man who came with the school, with the students, and we had a discussion afterwards. And we were talking about women and men and what it means to be a woman and sexuality and gender change and all of these things in a country where gay men are put in jail. So but the importance for us is to talk about the issues, is to be able to address the issues with people rather than try to change policy because we know there is very little hope in that way. We went to the streets. A lot of the company members were leading some big demonstrations right after Egypt, but it really failed, I would say. Yes, question here. Yes, I'm quite interested in this uh, distinction that you've drawn between the role of art in conflict and the role of art in post-conflict. I mean, conflict, well, there are some exceptions to this, but it's usually time-dated. Post-conflict is very, very long. Mm -hmm. uh, generations, many, many, many generations mm -hmm. often. And I'm interested in the issue of sustainability, first of all, in post-conflict but also this connection between art in conflict and art in post-conflict, whether there is an interrelationship between these and how an artist makes the distinction in his or her own mind or organizations make that distinction in terms of the type of action that they would do in those two separate, but I think are totally related uh, uh, concepts. At my uh, it, peace is so much more than the absence of war Mm. Uh, and Lebanon is both post-conflict and, in a sense, still in conflict, isn't it? Mm. Do, you, do you draw a distinction between these two things? Um, I guess it depends on uh, when, we're do like, when you're doing work as an artist, creating uh, work, doing, working with issues that are related to the pre-conflict are easier and also, not easier, but like we are very careful not to talk about current issues and make theater about the news. So it's important to, to deal with the history in order to talk about now. So I agree as well that I don't, because I live in a place where it's continuously in conflict, I, can, I see it as a continuum and I see it unfortunately going further into the future considering the situation of the region. So I, I always feel that all these events that have happened and that we can talk about in our work when we do our creative work uh, become also metaphors. So like mm. the, the previous events are actually a metaphor to talk about now. We did a performance about history, another one, where we were talking about our own histories as performers, saying I was born in 2014, which was the date where we were talking about, uh, the day when we were performing the show, but actually telling real stories from our being born in the war. But if you hear them, a lot of the public were from Syria and were very moved because mm. they felt we were talking about Syria. So somehow, there's a way to use the past in order to talk about the present. Um, yeah. Uh, Willie, you started work when Northern Ireland was still in conflict, and you've continued your work yeah. into what we call the post-conflict period. Do you believe it's genuinely post-conflict, or is it still fragile? And secondly, is there a difference in the way you approach it? Um, well, I still believe that the, the conflict continues. It's just in a different kind of phase at the moment. Mm -hmm. But I wouldn't say that it's been resolved and that we have peace, really, mm -hmm. whatever that means. Um, but yeah, I mean, I th when I was making the work, um, and I'll, I'll talk about it in terms of like pre uh, the Good Friday Agreement, say, which is in 1998. Um, that that work, um, I suppose, and, and as I outlined earlier, I mean, it, it was often in relation to how those events were being reported and talked about. Um, but I never thought of myself as, or my practice as being in any way connected to kind of journalism. But um, so I, I never felt the the need to kind of re ref reflect or kind of comment on the news, mm. but more on the, the kind of larger kind of issues, if you want. Mm. And to some extent, that 
has continued in the post Good Friday era. Uh, I mean, I, I've made a number of works, uh, one of which I showed here in Edinburgh at the Fruit Market Gallery, um, Ghost Story, uh, in 2007. And in 2013, I made a work called Remains, which, you know, um, I heard you mention this idea of it being kind of intergenerational or um, passing through a number of generations, the, this idea of, of post-conflict um, world, if you want. Uh, and this was a work that, um, that I made actually after a number of um, incidents uh, that occurred in 2012 where um, the practice of kneecapping, which you know, really kind of started in the 1970s in the north of Ireland with, and was used specifically by the provisionals to um, really police and control the um, Catholic or kind of nationalist community. Um, it, 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 it's never really gone away, you know, after the Good Friday Agreement, so, but it kind of spiked in 2011, 2012, um, when an organ, one of the dissident organizations called Republican Action Against Drugs started to kneecap um, people who were small-time drug users and suppliers. Um, and there was one particular incident in Derry where they kneecapped um, uh, two, a boy and his cousin from the same family. Um, and their father was told to bring these two boys along for execute or for um, kneecapping at, at a particular place at a set time. Uh, and he himself had been kneecapped when he was um, a teenager. Uh, and he was from a very kind of well-known and very staunch Republican family. Um, so it, the piece really w was then a piece about this, these places that I knew had been used to kneecap people in the 70s and 80s. And the same places are still used. So there is this kind of cycle of this kind of post-ceasefire world that doesn't really feel mm. much different from what it was like before. Um, so in that sense, the, the work has kind of changed, but not changed in a, in, in a kind of odd kind of way, you know? Um, so I mean, that, that, again, that sounds slightly kind of pessimistic when you, when you think of the, <laughs> the kind of post kind of um, Good Friday Agreement era. Um, but I mean, I, I, that, that, that really was the, the kind of direction that I, that I felt that the work needed to kind of travel in, you know? I mean, again, it kind of goes back to this idea of um, wanting to, uh, as an artist, kind of address some of those issues that, that, that are not spoken about or mm. uh, that people are either too frightened or ashamed to talk about, or, and also that kind of feed into um, uh, how, how government then begins to kind of respond to um, that level of dysfunction within the society that is meant to be kind of at peace and kind of normalized in some way. Um, and again, just to kind of go back to, the, to your question about um, that kind of relationship between policy and, and how an artist might function, I mean, I would, that's the only thing that would make me get involved in something like that is if I, if I felt that, that there was a kind of direct conduit or direct connection to um, having some possibility of shaping some of that language and some of that dialogue and some of that discussion. Otherwise, as a, personally as an artist, I'm really not that interested. Um, really because uh, over the last number of years, um, Derry was the UK city of culture, bizarrely, in 2013. And during that period, I had the opportunity to meet a couple of government ministers who turned up at kind of high profile events during the, the year of culture. And they were, as all politicians are, happy to be present at, at an opening and various things. But and, and in some ways, they were also happy to have a to start a dialogue. But um, it actually didn't go anywhere, you know. So the the level of their interest is, you know, not not very deep, um, which is disappointing. I was actually also invited to a lunch that. Um, was organized not by a minister, but a very high-ranking official within one of the main parties in the north of Ireland, in Stormont, to, with a group of other artists to 
talk about some of these issues, but it transpires that um, this person was leaving office within about six months and wanted something really to kind of leave behind as part of his legacy mm -hmm. within the grounds of Stormont. So, you know, it's very difficult to um, take seriously the, the, the kind of expressions of, of politicians to really engage with artists and, and really um, want to see uh, the kinds of contributions that the arts potentially could make when, you know, it actually doesn't want to do anything in the end. Yeah, I've got a question down, down here at the front. And then one up there. Yeah. For anyone attending this morning's tremendous reading by um, Maya's play, at the end there was a short Q&A and I was left with questions about what you had said, Maya, and I wondered if you and the rest of the panel might have anything to comment. Firstly, you said it is the desire to be comfortable that leads people not to act, and you refuse to split into different nations, but you use the idea of being comfortable. And then the next thing you s said went along the lines of um, there being a tremendous appetite in the West for the pain. So I'm wondering about <laughs> what kind of discomfort we might be seeking and it, how you might respond to people with such appetites for comfort or discomfort? I think this uh, appetite is not just from the West, and this is what go goes back to my idea about not saying there are nations who are silent, and that are, there are people who are silent, and people who are complacent with the systems that give them comfort, and that give them um, the good normal life. And I'm not blaming, and I think a lot of people from who are seeking, like a lot of refugees are seeking this life as well. But I think there's a thin line between living a good life as a person and living a comfortable life and not being, and not wanting to know what is behind the wall. Mm -hmm. So I think it's just about being aware and being open to difference and being willing. I think it goes back to what you were saying, Asa, to, to being willing to share and to not have everything that is that you are used to have in order to live a more rich life, I would say. And, uh, and I think it's, it's very difficult, and it's not something that can happen easily, especially because everything around us doesn't allow us to, go, to, book, to take that step because uh, the systems want us to be complacent and want us to not know and want us to, to, to close down. But today with the internet and the access everybody has to information, mm. there is a responsibility in it. And, and this goes back to this idea of appetite, which is different. It's, this, this, it's not enough to hear a story, a sad story, in order to feel purged or it's really, and this is very tricky with art because a lot of the art is also, when it comes from a real place, it can be really saddening and it can affect people. What's important is to be able to have this distance and acknowledge a sad story, but think about what can I do in my life today that can change maybe 0.0001% of this sad story. Um, yes, so you're, you're nodding vigorously. I mean, the point yeah. is, isn't it to, you ask of a, of, of a piece of art to expose yourself to a different way of seeing. At yeah. somebody, it's a different, an experience is different to your own, which sometimes challenges and ov overturns your own way yeah. of thinking. Yeah, I mean, I'm nodding because I'm, I'm connecting back in my mind to what you've just said, but also what you asked about bad art, as it were, <coughs> and what you asked, David, about government policy changing art. I have observed that if art in any format, and, and, and you can't define and categorise absolutes, absolutely anything, but I have seen art that is two things, and it's always bad, and it always is comfortable for government and changes nothing. And that is if art is extractive, and if it 
promotes and allows the single storyline to go through. So if the artists or funders are extracting stories, pain, images, beautiful faces, preferably in hijabs, um, for their Just career progression eyes. or for, yes, green eyes, please, <laughs> um, then that is extracting people's lives and stories for other m purposes. It, that never ends well and it never changes or challenges anything. And if it, there's a brilliant po a TEDx talk by a, a Nigerian author called Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie, mm. I hope I pronounced yeah. her name correctly, called The Danger of the Single, Single Story. Story. Go yeah. and listen, it's mm. brilliant. And it's about the fact that there is never a single story. And if a piece of art allows you to comfortably be lulled into believing that there is a single story, then ditto as above. Yeah. So I think that touches on various things we've been talking about. And again, as an, both as an academic and as an activist and as a chair of an, of an organization, I've seen again and again projects getting funding, getting approval, getting excellent ratings because it's easy and enjoyable. And, Even, and, and there's something, yeah, and you just think, okay, what next? What does it leave? What does it change? And we were talking earlier before coming into this room about some, there's something almost pornographic about the need to observe the suffering of others. And it's an itch, you scratch it and you go home to your lovely house. And then, and then what? Mm. So I, yeah. Let's take a question from up there at the back. And then I'm going to have to, <coughs> does anybody else have a question? There's one, there's one there as well. So Thank you very much. I, I, think, um, I, I think what uh, Issa and Harriet and uh, particularly uh, Maya have been saying, um, it, this is more of a reflection than a question, but it may invite comments, which is the, the, how this relates to the piece that's going to be on that stage this evening, Minefield, which is resolutely a piece that allows the different narratives to emerge, but not from artists, though it's through the eyes of an artist, but through the actual competence from the war. Mm. Uh, which is unique in my experience, and it was a very powerful piece of drama as a result. Um, so it picks up your point about talking to your enemies because they were former combatants. But I suppose the reflection is, um, is this a model? Because this is being used as not only a first-rate piece of drama, minefield, but also as a means of advancing cultural relations and indeed diplomatic relations between two countries that were at war 30 years ago. And, um, and, and of accepting that there's not just one story. Story, yeah, and accepting that there's not just one story, exactly. And I'm just wondering whether this is a model, without imposing it on any artist, that actually could be further developed, because it seems to be a remarkably powerful way of actually doing it in the hands of the right people. You Let, let's just get a, a, a before before we seek answers to that. Let's just get one more comment or question. It's, it's just a quick remark because I'm Italian. I come from Milan, which is uh, ciao, come <laughs> stai? <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, I, I just wanted to share with you um, a thought, a very simple thought. I'm a I'm a cultural broadcaster, so I'm I deal with culture every day, just like all of you. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is one episode in Milan history which is very important. 1947, the Piccolo Teatro, which is the most important theater in Italy, has been created by Giorgio Strehler and Paolo Grassi, just kicking down uh, with their, uh, just, just bumping into the door of uh, an old building, a Renaissance building, which had been uh, occupied by the Austrians, the Spanish, the French, and all the people that went through Milan <laughs> during the history, and finally became a jail where the Nazis would, would torture partisans. And so that is a very typical example of culture trying to deal with post-conflict. 1947, uh, the, the city was completely destroyed by um, bombs from everybody. I mean, Germans, Americans, English, and everybody threw a bomb on Milan. <laughs> and, uh, and so the whole, the whole thing started through a symbol. And mm. this is the point I wanted to share with you, the power of symbols in moments of post-conflict. Because had not happened that way, that particular episode wouldn't have the same strength. In two years before, and then I'll cut short, um, the first democratic mayor of Milan decided that uh, the best celebration after the war would have been people dancing to the same tune in all the courtyards still left in the city. And it was an amazing, magical night uh, as far as the people who still live uh, 
tell it mm. and have uh, reminded it. Mm. So this was just an example to tell you from a country where we can't uh, avoid, we are not in the comfortable position of uh, avoiding migration. We yeah. have it. We've been having it for 15 years. We have been seeing it going on. And it's going to happen, mm. I tell you. It, there's no way of stopping it. So th there is no wall that will stop this phenomenon, which is natural. Anyway, uh, the power of symbols, mm. especially um, in, in consideration of what we've been talking till now. Thank mm. you. Thank you. That's uh, a beautiful observation to, to bring the event to an end yes. with. Essa, you're Italian. Does that? <laughs> you're half Italian, half Scottish. Both, yeah. Both, yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. That was a really powerful symbol. And there's many others. There's iconic moments in the history of Italy that are about challenging the power of not so much government as state and what it represents and what has it has represented. And now it's really interesting in terms of what's been happening. As you say, in the past 15 years, there's been a huge rise in the amount of people coming to Italy because of where it is. Just as people have always invaded and, you know, militarily invaded Italy because of where it is. But then they became the people in power and now the people in power are talking about invasions and influxes and tides and all mm. these things. Um, it's a question of, of who uses those symbols and how, though, I would say. Mm. Um, because Italy is a country where still, in last year, there's a, there was a, a minister who's female and born in Africa, and her skin is black. And she was at a, just a talk in a, in a square in, in our country, and people threw bananas at her, and that was OK. Mm. Mm. So some people use symbols in different ways, and it... It's very dangerous. So it, you, in 47 yeah. was all about getting people to talk to each other after symbols had been used mm -hmm. very mm -hmm. badly, mm -hmm. if we want to put it that way. Harriet. Well, picking up on the idea of symbols, obviously Picasso's Guernica is one of the mm. iconic paintings about the brutality of war. And one of the most symbolic moments was when there's a tapestry of it hanging in the United Nations mm. and it was covered up before mm. the US announced their invasion um, of Iraq. Uh, in a really knowing moment of actually the power of art to talk about the horrors of war. Mm. Yeah. And I think that takes us back to your question. Of course, there's not a clean line between uh, post-conflict and uh, the heat of conflict. And equally, there's preventing conflict. And I think that's where our responsibility to be uncomfortable as people yeah. here in Britain who sit on the UN Security Council and are deeply involved in the geopolitics and many of the wars around the world. That's where I think it's our responsibility to try to shift our governments to not see that the choice is always between, mm, shall we bomb or shall we not bomb? But there's a choice <laughs> between, shall we intervene militarily at, or shall we intervene in a peace building way to prevent conflict? And why don't we give the resources to that side of the equation that we pour mm. into training and equipping people to go in and kill? And let's put the same amount, 250 times more if we could put it into peace building. Imagine the flowering of the arts and how it could really help actually people find solutions to many of the conflicts. For those of you who haven't seen Minefield, which is on, I think, on again tonight, it's a play by an Argentine writer and director who's brought together three Argentine veterans of the Falklands or Malvinas War and three British. Uh, and the play, they, each of those six men play themselves. Uh, and the play is, the script is based on their stories, both of the war itself and living with the memory of the war in the 35 years since. Uh, Maya, you're, I think you're the only one apart from me on the panel who's, who's seen it. Mm -hmm. what, were, what were your impressions of it? Um, I think I, I mean it's a very interesting idea and it's a very interesting work and um, I think I'm very skeptical about uh, how to say like putting people on stage and theatricalizing their stories to that extent that it becomes so entertaining. So at the, I was at some point very uncomfortable because it was, f for me, too entertaining in a sense that at some point I couldn't connect to the stories. Mm. It still is a very good piece of theater. It still is a good th piece of theater that allows you to think about the history, uh, about reconciliation. But for me, I think there was something there that... Was it over-theatrical? It was, it was over-enjoyable. 
<laughs> that was my uncomfort in it. You weren't uncomfortable enough. I was uncomfortable that it was, yeah, it was so you were, enjoyable. You were uncomfortable that you were so comfortable. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. Okay, well, I hope that gives you a different way of seeing. Uh, minefield, I saw it no too, and I, I was, cl was closer to your interpretation of it until I had a conversation with Maya, who op <laughs> earlier on, who opened my eyes to a different way of thinking about it. So. Very uncomfortable with it, but comfortable in a comfortable way. <laughs> I'm comfortable in a comfortable way. <laughs> Um, look, thank you, thank you very much to all of you for, for coming. I have to uh, have to wind this up. We're already over time. It's been a tremendously enjoyable session for me. I hope you've enjoyed it too. Please show your appreciation for these four amazing people.